Don't do anything I wouldn't do. Come for a drink. <laughs> Today, electric light is completely taken for granted, though without it our lives would be infinitely more difficult and dangerous. Creating all this light has taken an enormous amount of effort and ingenuity. In this programme, Rex and I are going to look at the evolution and workings of this almost indispensable invention. The first form of artificial light was obviously fire. Once the fire was burning well, you could take out a branch and use it as a primitive sort of torch. Trouble was, it tended to go out. Some countries had particularly resinous woods, like pitch pine, that burnt particularly well. Most countries developed some way of using oil or fat for light. The ancient Greeks and Romans squashed the oil out of olives, poured it into a bowl with um, some sort of a wick, soaked in oil. They then lit pretty puny flame. Oh no, it is just about a light. Northern European countries developed the candle. But these weren't like modern candles. They were made of animal fat. And they smelt pretty disgusting. And they tended to spit. And every few minutes you'd have to trim the wick. Meanwhile, whole animals and birds were used as candles in some parts of the world, particularly petrels. Here we have the early petrol lighter. Not so good as the candlefish. A little slippery, but very effective. As for me, boy, oh, I have a penguin to keep me warm. <laughs> Keeps a light for hours, weighs a ton, though. Oh, dear. These early candles provided so little light that most people went to bed soon after sunset. I'll try to get some sleep with that bloody penguin out. Psychologists now believe that sleep evolved mainly to protect us from the dark. The possibility of using electricity for lighting was first suggested in 1810 by Humphrey Davy. Shorting out a large battery he'd been given, the electricity arced through the air, bridging the gap, almost like lightning. This intense light formed the basis of the first commercial arc lights in the 1840s. They needed to have quite an elaborate clockwork mechanism to move the electrodes progressively closer together because they gradually burnt away. Arc lamps continued to have specialist uses, like film lighting, until quite recently. However, the large amount of current used prevented them ever becoming widely adopted. Meanwhile, lighting had started to improve in the early 19th century with the introduction of gaslight. By 1850, it had been installed in most cities, although the search for a better electric light continued. Humphrey Davy had also noticed that electricity heats up any wire it's passing through to some extent, and that it was possible to make a wire glow white hot. We're using a welder as a power supply here, and uh, we should be able to turn out the lights and should give up enough. only going at the bottom but it should that's it but the problem is at some point it gets so hot that it starts to melt whoops <laughs> however well, we better have the lights back on don't we yeah. carbon melts at a much higher temperature than most sorts of metal and several inventors started experimenting with carbon filaments. Rex had this idea that we could uh, do this with a pencil, whoops, pencil lead that's uh, also made of graphite sort of carbon. So first we've got to burn off the wood round the lead. Well this works much better and the steel rod. But the trouble is that even the carbon filament doesn't last for very long because it reacts with the air 
and uh, slowly deteriorates. Get a little bit hotter than that. The solution to this problem is to enclose the filament in a glass container and pump the air out so that it can't react with it. And that's the reason for the light bulb. Well, Rex and I have had some success making a light bulb like this, enclosing the pencil lead in a milk bottle. And uh, now we turn on the vacuum pump, start pumping out the air, and uh, connect it up. Yeah. If you okay. if we switch it on, why is the air is pumped out? This is actually sucking more of the uh, any air that's trapped in the filament out as well. We should great. be able to. If you let go, you should be able to turn the light out. You should be able to make it work as a bulb now. You can turn it up. Now. You can turn it up now. It's now it's working, can't we? Nearly as good as an ordinary light bulb, really. A chemist from Newcastle called Joseph Swan tried repeatedly to make a light bulb like this in the 1860s, but eventually gave up, concluding that his vacuum pump just wasn't good enough. Fifteen years later, discovering a better sort of pump, he tried again and succeeded in 1878. Meanwhile, Thomas Edison, here seen in his old age, had started experimenting in America in 1877. Backed by a lot of money and a dedicated team at his laboratory, he developed a similar light bulb within two years. Swan and Edison faced enormous difficulties even once their bulbs were working. There was no electricity to plug into at the time. Edison in particular had to dig up the roads to lay his cables and even built the first power stations to enable his lights to be used. Then, to persuade people to buy his electricity, he staged lots of publicity stunts, particularly with people wearing light bulbs in unusual places. The task of persuading people to install electricity wasn't made any easier because the original gas lights, just uh, a simple gas flames, had been dramatically improved in the 1870s with the invention of the gas mantle. This is made of a material that glows white hot at a particularly low temperature. If I light the whole thing up now, that it should all burst into light. I've got these two in my kitchen. I just like the soft greenish light they cast. They don't smoke or smell, and they're as bright as ordinary electric lights. Many houses didn't actually install electricity till the 1930s because their gas lights were so good. <laughs> Electricity finally triumphed because it could be used for so many other things besides lighting. Oh, bother. You know, there's only one plug in this room, and we've already got the fire and the clock and the radio and the standard lamp connected to it. Now you want the table lamp for your sewing machine. Never mind, dear. We'll manage somehow. If father wants to play about at being an electrician, you mustn't begrudge him a little clean sun. The main improvement in an ordinary modern bulb is that it has a filament made of a metal called tungsten. It's easier to see in a clear bulb. This metal has the highest melting point of any metal. With tungsten filaments, our milk bottle lights work nearly as well as real light bulbs. In a real bulb, though, the tungsten is coiled up and it, if you look at it under a magnifying glass the coil is made up of another even finer tiny coil it's called a coiled coil the more compactly a filament can be wound the less heat it loses to the surroundings and the brighter it glows oh no the bulb's gone again <laughs> You wouldn't have to go through this performance. Light bulbs never last forever because at their working temperature, two and a half thousand degrees centigrade, the filament gradually evaporates. Boy, where's the bulb? 
Aren't it one of the new ones? Thorn EMI double life light bulbs. Double the life, but not double the cost. In the late 50s, a dramatically improved sort of filament bulb was invented, tungsten halogen. These are used for outside lights, for um, car headlights, and for tiny little shop spotlights. They give off twice as much light as ordinary bulbs running at a higher temperature. And even so, they last twice as long. This is because they have minute traces of gases inside called halogens, which repel the evaporating tungsten from the surface of the bulb, making it redeposit itself back on the filament, a sort of cycle. This only works if the glass is kept very hot, 250 degrees centigrade. That's uh, easily enough to boil water. The problem with any sort of filament light, though, is that it's actually extremely wasteful of energy. An ordinary bulb only gives out 10% of its electricity as light. All the rest is wasted as heat. And even the most efficient tungsten halogen bulb only gives out 25% as light. There's more to lighting, though, than simple efficiency. It's also extremely decorative. And there's an astonishing range of decorative bulbs available. I incorporate lights in all sorts of things that I make. This ring was inspired by these little bright red lights. They look to me like sort of modern jewels. This is a bedside light I made, like a sort of office block with its window cleaners. This is a nuclear mint in here. It's a packet of mints I bought at the shop of our local nuclear reactor, the visitor centre. So I lit it to make it look suitably dangerous. Lights aren't only decorative. Films in particular have always used them for their dramatic effect. No, you're wrong. That's how you always intended to spend the evening, not with George at all. Don't say that. And for a very good reason. Now you keep quiet. Don't say that. Now keep quiet. Molly, now listen to me. Listen to me, Molly. Don't have to listen to you. I think I know the truth, Molly. No, you don't. You don't know anything at all. I think I know the truth about George. You can't. You don't. You couldn't have met George tonight. No, no, no. Because there isn't any George. No, no, no. <laughs> Well, how's this, Nancy? Better, huh? Oh, this is wonderful. I wished I had one of those magic wands so I could fly around whenever I wanted to. Nothing simpler, Nancy. Here. However, that wand is good for much more important things than flying around through the air. It's a fluorescent light tube. Today's efficient fluorescent lights developed from the original arc lights. This tiny high voltage arc doesn't reach far or give off much light. But um, if I connect the wires to the ends of this glass tube, switch it on again, switch off the lights, and start pumping the air out of the tube. Instead of forming an arc, the electricity fills the entire tube with a glowing discharge. This is the basis of fluorescent and many other types of electric light. Although in its basic form, it's not really bright enough to be useful. When it was first discovered, these tubes were bent into funny shapes and demonstrated as wonders of science. If I apply a voltage to this one, you can see it flows. And over here, we have the selection that we borrowed from the Royal Institution, They're called Diesler tubes. And they were made in the 1860s. In 1905, a French inventor called Georges Claude found that a newly discovered gas, neon, made the tube glow bright red. He immediately realised its potential for illuminated signs and by the 1920s had managed to sell a large number of franchises, particularly in America. The first fluorescent light was introduced in 1939. 
This is the same idea as our vacuum tube, except there's a little tungsten filament at each end. The idea is that uh, heating these up for a moment encourages the electricity to start flowing. In the tube, there's a starter to do this switching and a ballast to limit the amount of current that can pass through it. The inside of the tube is filled with a mixture of argon and mercury vapour. This is giving out mostly ultraviolet light. That's why I'm wearing these protective goggles. But fortunately, there are chemicals that can convert the ultraviolet to visible light, a property called fluorescence. If I switch the light off for a minute, you can see they're actually just white powders. Tube manufacturers mix these fluorescent materials, creating any colour, combination of colours, they want. See if I can get some to... These are coated onto the inside of the tube. Neon tubes can also be coated in phosphors, creating almost a complete spectrum of colours. The odd thing about fluorescent tubes is you don't even have to connect them to electricity to make them work. If I put this one in a microwave oven, switch on, it will work. And if you excite it by a radio frequency or a very high frequency, um, it will also work without being connected. Like this. I've got a, another milk bottle here and we've put fluorescent materials inside this, st stuck it on the inside. I've evacuated this one that's connected up to my vacuum pump and uh, if I connect this up to our high frequency again, we'll have a fluorescent milk bottle. I've made ordinary filament light bulbs which appear to be uh, uh, normal but if you look at this one it's a big trick and it's actually wires run up the back of my hand to a battery and this was made for a magician. Fluorescent tubes are highly efficient giving out four times as much light for the same amount of electricity as an ordinary light bulb. They've become the standard lighting for factories, shops and offices providing uniform brightness over vast areas. However, architects and designers now often deliberately use lighting to create different moods. Lighting is not only bulbs, no, it's an environment enhancing, ambience arousing concept. Uh, Look, please, uh, at this stylish desk light, which offers superb visual clarity for workstations. Ah, oh, perfect. Beige is such a tricky colour to work with. And this versatile grid makes imaginative and creative focus for reception areas. Why, I? Disco lights? Slashing? Now a soft, diffuse light for those relaxing coffee breaks. And for my yoga. Um. Finally, this suggestive personal light for those confidential business propositions. Hey. Well, Brenda, how about it? That concludes my... Brilliant! Oh, thank you. Wonderful. 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 Thank you. An ever-increasing range of practical, efficient lights is available. Small fluorescents, complete with control gear that plug into an ordinary light sockets has been developed. I've recently converted my workshop to them. They're expensive, but they last for 8,000 hours and they're very efficient. If everyone had them, Britain would use about 10% less electricity. Then tubes full of mercury and other gases called halides have been developed. My workshop's full of them at the moment because they're, they're used as modern film lights. Then tubes full of sodium originally just used as street lights and now increasingly used indoors in public places. These are twice as efficient again as fluorescent lights, although they do give everything a rather horrid orange colour. 
In fact, any light modifies the colours of the surfaces that it shines on, though our eyes normally compensate for this, so we don't notice the difference. But with a partition to separate the two lights, you can see how dramatic the differences can be. The reason for these differences in colour is that every sort of light creates a slightly different spectrum of colours. With this slit I've left in my workshop window and a prism, I should be able to separate out the spectrum of daylight, literally the colours of the rainbow. A filter called a diffraction grating has the same effect in separating colours. With the diffraction grating over half of the camera lens, I can split any light up into its spectrum of colours. A filament light always has a complete spectrum, though there's rather more red and yellow and less blue than there is in daylight, creating a warm sort of effect. All the other lights we've been looking at have uh, a less even spectrum. This fluorescent light, for instance, creates uh, quite distinct separate bands of colour. The um, sodium light creates almost only orange light, which is why it's so bad at distinguishing colours. True colours can really only be seen in daylight. Daylight is also simply much brighter than most artificial light. In the camera, you have to shut down the iris, literally making a smaller hole for it to look out of. Our eyes do this automatically, so we don't notice the difference in brightness, just as we don't notice the differences in colours. Daylight also has therapeutic qualities, which led to enthusiasm for artificial sunlight. You certainly have got your ideas attuned to modern things in double quick time. You've been thinking electrically. Ah, oh, you know, Amelia, this artificial sunbathing is a marvellous tonic. I'll bet you feel braced up no end. Is that teapot ready? And now pull up to the fire, ladies, and make yourselves comfortable and have a cup of tea. It's nice when there are no men about to sit cosily by the electric fire and have a good gossip, isn't it? Oh dear, it says in here, if I have to work indoors all day, I should be taking lots of extra vitamins. <laughs> That's better. Ah, uh, Terry! That's disgusting! You should be getting out into the fresh air. That will get rid of your spots. Brian, did you know that working indoors speeds up the balding process? What? Brenda, do you ever feel under the weather from working in artificial light? No, I keep it down the leisure centre. Dancer size. Poor Jones depressed. She needs to get out. But Mr Jones is fine. He's happy pottering around the golf course. I said I want that file now! She's the one. Stress. I'll pop this in her in tray. I presume this is yours. I don't know what it was doing in my in tray. I don't subscribe to all this new age twaddle, unlike you. Oh, my head. I have to go out for a minute, get some fresh air. I knew it. I was right. I do miss daylight myself when I've been working indoors at my desk for long periods. I also feel slightly sad the night is never, ever completely dark anymore, even here in the country, making the stars dimmer and dimmer. But despite its drawbacks, electric light is extremely useful, and there's also just something rather beautiful about it all.
the most memorable thing about uh, the electric light or filming it um, was uh, that we actually fused the whole lighthouse and made the light go out um, <laughs> for about half an hour. Uh, the thing is that it was the Secret Life Machines was made on film, um, and film at that time still required uh, a lot of light, much more than uh, camcorders like this one I'm filming on now. Um, so. Filming at night uh, just required a lot of light. You can't just film black. So um, they had to put lights all in the streets of Southwold. Uh, and the same in my garden. Um, oh yeah, because the uh, a fuse box in, in the house uh, melted and uh, was smoking. <laughs> so our house nearly caught fire as well. Um, you don't think that... Uh, filming at night when everything looks so dark actually uses such an enormous amount of <laughs> electric light to make it work. I've still got those gas lights in my kitchen um, and they're still actually useful uh, when we have power cuts which we do in the country sometimes um, and also um, they make this nice hissing sound and provide a bit of warmth so sometimes in the winter it's a sort of cosy sort of heat, even though the light is a bit uh, greeny. Um, I still like them. I really enjoyed playing with uh, spectroscopes, um, splitting the spectrum up into the different uh, wavelengths and you know, some lights like tungsten light um, show evenly through the spectrum whereas others like fluorescent lights and LEDs have much more sort of specific uh, wavelengths that, uh, of light that they give out. Um, I'd been very influenced as a student by a book called The Eye and the Brain by uh, Professor Richard Gregory who later became a great friend and he was a sort of a hero of mine and a sort of mentor almost. Uh, um, I got to know him actually because of The Secret Life of Machines. He invited me to a conference. Uh, but his a book, The Eye and the Brain, was was just made me as a young when I was young, just really aware how the eye just can't pick up everything and your brain is making interpreting it and making it into the three D world that uh, we perceive. So Richard was keen on uh, optical illusions, this way that you could fool your brain. Um and equally um, electric lights are sort of fooling your brain into thinking that you're seeing a smooth spectrum when you're actually only uh, they're only lighting up very specific wavelengths but as, as you, they just have to try different things until your brain it sort of accepts it um, so that was fun I enjoyed all that side of it so how have things changed um, well I probably was a bit too kind about compact fluorescent lights. Uh, as time went on, I realised they didn't really last very long at all. Um, maybe they did in theory, but uh, in practice they lasted no more than an ordinary light bulb. Uh, and then, not very good for recycling, um, mercury in the tube and electronics difficult to recycle. Um, but now, of course, LEDs have come along, uh, which are um, much better. Uh, and I love LEDs, so uh, uh, they're altogether uh, a much better solution. Uh, interestingly, uh, in fluorescent lights, the phosphors that go on the tube, that is actually what's inside a white LED. It's actually a blue LED um, with um, phosphors on the top. Um, very similar to the ones on fluorescent tubes. I know old-fashioned tungsten lights were inefficient, but uh, sometimes, though, the heat was very useful. Uh, I mean, specific things, like I used to um, have a, a cabinet in my workshop to keep it warm overnight when I was trying to um, dry some fiberglass or something like that. Um, but, but even in a house, um, the heat just adds to the general heat and uh, so your boiler will on, be on for slightly less time because of the heat of the light bulb. Um, I know it's not um, 
electric heat is uh, expensive compared to gas, but uh, uh, I sometimes think that it was perhaps a bit too demonised. I don't know. Anyway, LEDs are better, so it doesn't matter really. I still love lights. It's sort of they're sort of magical, and uh, LEDs because they're so small and versatile. Um, enable all sorts of beautiful effects. I really enjoy adding the lighting to my arcade machines and other things I make. Um, I'm very glad to have uh, been alive while they've uh, been introduced and uh, enjoyed finding all sorts of things to do with them. So lighting has changed for the better, definitely.